Welcome to West Valley Foursquare Church. My name is Ashley Jaeger, and we are so glad that you're joining us for Church Online this morning. I am the children's director, as well as I serve on the worship team. This last week, I've really started to get into a rhythm with this new temporary normal. And I'm trying to remind myself that this is temporary. Hebrews 10, 35 through 36 says, so don't throw away your confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. And then you will receive all that he has promised. Patient endurance, what does that even mean? Well, what I think it means is to wait with a good attitude as well as keep going when the season is unknown, unwanted, unpleasant, and uncomfortable. That's exactly what we're going through, wouldn't you agree? And we need patient endurance, and we need to hold on to the God who loves us and cares for us in a time like this. I'm here to remind you that while it may seem hard, it is possible to have patient endurance. Just hold on to Jesus, and you're gonna get through this. I wanna let you know of an upcoming series that we're gonna begin next Sunday called Coping Through Quarantine, It's Okay Not To Be Okay. We're gonna be addressing things like addictive behavior and patterns, marriage, finances, parenting, emotions such as anger, loneliness, depression, and we don't want you to miss this. So join us next Sunday for Church Online as we start this new series. We wanna connect with you during this time, so we are asking that you would like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Also, check your email on Sunday nights because we send out a weekly newsletter. There's different content that we're sharing on a daily and weekly basis. For example, Pastor Andrew is doing daily devotionals that are being sent through Facebook as well as that weekly email. And I'm providing something called Friday Fives through the Kids City Facebook page. These are ways that we're trying to help you grow and mature spiritually during this season. Also, we have a wonderful youth ministry and they're gonna to start to change the way that they're meeting with kids on Wednesday nights. They will start meeting this week through Zoom. If you need information on how to join the Zoom meeting, please text or email Pastor Zach. Again, this is a fun time for your youth to be engaged with games, the Word of God, as well as their friends that they are missing from church. Please again contact Pastor Zach through text or email for information on how to get an invitation to that Zoom link. As you prepare to give of your tithe and offering, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for partnering with us as we all continue to do kingdom work through this quarantine. Kingdom work doesn't stop, even though it feels like our world has stopped. There are a couple different ways that you can give. You can give through bill pay through your bank. You can give through the app. You can write a check or you can give online at wvfc.church. Now would you join us for worship? Happy Sunday, family. Join me as we worship together.
are. you 
sing you are peace. putting our trust in you because you are able. You can do anything. We trust you and we know that our peace comes only from you. God, so we don't let fear in anymore. Anxiety, anything that would control our minds and that would control our lives, God, we give you full reign and full glory over us and over our city and our country. God, you know what you're doing. You are in control. So we claim that today. We claim that you are in control. We stand on the truths 
of your word and the truth that you have placed in our heart. God, thank you for being who you are. We love you so much in your name. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Tom, and I'm the lead pastor at West Valley Foursquare Church. And I want to thank you for taking some time and participating in our service today. We've been talking about the New Testament. And uh, last week, I, I broke it up into three different sections, Jesus, and then the early church, and then the second coming. And so we've already talked about Jesus. We've talked about the early church. And today we want to talk about the second coming. I hope this video finds you and your family doing well. We're in our household. We're, we're doing well. We're, we're healthy, getting a little stir crazy. But um, these are kind of crazy times that we're living in with the pandemic that's going on. It's interesting. I've, I've, I've kind of watched what people are saying, where this came from. The, there's one idea, and I better, put my, I better put my foil hat on for this one, because one of the ideas that's going around is it's the new 5G towers that there are, and the radiation is changing the molecular structure of the stars or the Mars, and, and then now it's... Yeah, I don't really believe that one either, but it's always good to have a foil hat. There's another one that the Cabal and Bill Gates, they've designed this to depopulate the earth. I don't think that's it either. What about the China? Their military is making this bioweapon to destroy America, but it accidentally got released and then it hurt their own... Yeah. I bet the... Reality is, it was an accident uh, somehow in a wet market in Wuhan, China, that caused this to be. But it's it's interesting listening. I was there's a a prophetess talking last week that I was listening to her presentation, and she was saying this is leading us to the to the one world government and one world religion, common currency. Yeah. Some people are saying this is. This is the end. You know, this is the end times. This is the day of the Lord. Do you know that phrase? The day of the Lord. I have a video again from the Bible Project that talks about the day of the Lord. So sit back and enjoy this video. The day of the Lord. It's a phrase in the Bible that religious people use, usually when talking about the end of the world. Yeah, things like Armageddon or the apocalypse. You might be familiar with this image of Jesus returning on a white horse. He's got a sword to bring final judgment. And everyone wants to know, how will it all go down? So a lot of these images come from the last book of the Bible, but to understand them, you have to go back to the first book. When the story begins, we watch God create an amazing world, and then he gives humans power to rule over it on his behalf. But the humans are tempted by this mysterious, unhuman character who offers them a promise. You could define good and evil on your own terms and put yourselves in God's place. Which is what they do. And the resulting stories are about the broken relationships and violence that results. Yeah, this promise creates huge problems. Now everyone has to protect themselves and fight for survival, and they're all using death as this weapon to gain power. It all leads to a story about the building of the city of Babylon. Or in Hebrew, Babel. Everyone comes together to elevate themselves to the place of God. And God knows how devastating this could be. A whole culture redefining good and evil as if they are God. So God confuses their language and scatters them. Now from here on, Babylon becomes like an icon in the biblical story. It's an image that represents humanity's corporate rebellion against God. And the next time we see it is in the story of ancient Egypt. Yeah, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he feels threatened by these immigrant Israelites. He starts killing all of the boys, enslaving the rest. And this is really evil. Yeah, Egypt's like this bigger, badder Babylon. They take care of themselves at the expense of others by redefining evil as good. And so God turns Pharaoh's evil back on him. His pride drives him forward, and he's swallowed up by death. Now, after this great deliverance, the Israelites sing a song about how God is their warrior who liberated them from evil. And the Israelites referred to this moment as the day. The day they were rescued from a corrupt human system. 
And every year since then, the Israelites have celebrated the day of their liberation with this symbolic meal of a sacrificial lamb that's called Passover. Eventually, Israel comes into its own land, have their own kings, and they face new enemies. So that past day of the Lord, celebrated every Passover, begins to generate hope that God will bring the day again to save Israel from new threats. Now, out in the hills was a sheep herder named Amos. He was appointed by God as a prophet to announce shocking news to Israel, that God was bringing another day of the Lord against his enemies, and this time the target is Israel. What? Sadly, Israel's leaders had also redefined good and evil for themselves, resulting in corruption and violence. So God's people have become like Babylon, the oppressed become oppressors. Babylon seems like a trap no one can escape. And so the day of the Lord comes upon Israel. They're conquered, taken captive into exile. And from then on, Israel suffered under the rule of continuous oppressive empires. This is the story Jesus was born into. Yeah, in his day, the oppressive empire over Israel is Rome. So is Jesus going to confront Rome, take him out? Well, no. Jesus saw the real enemy as that mysterious, unhuman evil. The evil that's lured Babylon, Egypt, Rome, Israel, all humanity has given in to evil's promise of power. This is what Jesus resisted alone in the wilderness when he was tempted to exploit his power for self-interest. But he didn't. And after that, he started to confront the effects of evil on others. Yeah, he started saying that he was going to Jerusalem for Passover for a final showdown to confront the evil of Israel and Rome by dying. Dying? I mean, that feels like losing. Jesus was going to let evil exhaust all of its power on him, using its only real weapon, death. Jesus knew that God's love and life were even more powerful, that he could overcome evil by becoming the Passover lamb, giving his life in an act of love. And something changed that day. When Jesus defeated evil, he opened up a new way for anyone to escape from Babylon and discover this new kind of power, this new way of being human. Okay, so something changed. But the power of evil is still alive and well, and we keep building new versions of Babylon. Right, and so the last book of the Bible, the Revelation, points to the future and final day of the Lord. It's when God's kingdom comes to confront Babylon the Great, this image of all the corrupt nations of the world. Yeah, this is it, Armageddon, final judgment. How is Jesus going to finish off evil? Well, that's not how you'd expect. In the Revelation, the victorious Jesus is symbolized by a sacrificial bloody lamb. And then when Jesus does arrive in the end, riding his white horse to confront evil, he's bloody before the battle even starts. Pre-bloodied? That's a strange image. Yeah, it's because Jesus isn't out for our blood. Rather, he overcame with his blood when he died for his enemies. And the sword is in his mouth. It's a symbol of Jesus' authority to define good and evil and hold us accountable when he brings final justice once and for all. And so, in the meantime, the day of the Lord is an invitation to resist the culture of Babylon. And it's a promise that God will one day free our world from corruption and bring about the new thing that he has in store. Well, I hope you know more about the day of the Lord than you did six minutes ago. Well, Pastor Tom, when is the end of the age? When is Jesus coming back? Is the coronavirus in the Bible? Well, well let me try to answer those questions by reading a passage of scripture from Matthew 24. Jesus' disciples came to him. I'm, I'm reading in verse 3, and he's sitting on the Mount of Olives, and, and they just had this private session with him, and they ask him, questions that are quite similar. They say, tell us, when will these things be? There's three different questions they're asking, and the first one is in reference to what he had just been showing them the temple and told them there won't be one stone laid upon another stone. They'll, you know, this temple is going to be, be knocked down. And so they're asking him, when will these things be? And will, when will be the sign of your coming? Most likely talking about the, his second coming. And when is the end of the age? So three different questions. So Jesus answers and says to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Now, 
this uh, is not saying that people are going to come and say, I'm Jesus Christ. You know, that, now that happens every once in a while. But this verse is saying they will say, I'm the Christ. I'm, I'm the anointed one. So people will come and say, you know, I have a better revelation than you do. Or I have a more of a revelation. Or God speaks to me and he doesn't speak to you. That type of thing. That's what this is talking about. Verse 6 says, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See, see that you are not troubled, for these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. And certainly we've heard about wars and rumors of wars. I mean, with the Internet, we hear about them in real time. Verse 7 says, For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be many famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. And we see that. Now, this is where I would put the coronavirus under pestilence, and it's plural. So this isn't the first time we've had a virus in the world. There's Zika and Ebola and influenza and the polio. So you know, look back in history, and they're plural. There's a lot of them. And uh, in verse 8 it says, And these are the beginning of sorrows, which is a phrase that is talking about a woman going into labor. The, the beginning of sorrows. And when a woman begins to go in labor, maybe the contractions aren't as hard and they aren't as frequent. I remember Tammy, maybe about a week before Shauna was born, she said, I think I just had a contraction. You know, it was so weak and you know, maybe the first one that she didn't know. But then as things moved along, the contractions got harder and, and they were closer together. Verse 9 says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now, most likely, this is Jesus is talking directly to the disciples about what's going to happen to them around the same time as the destruction of the temple. The reason why I would say that is because in the harmony of Gospels, there are this, what I'm reading in Matthew 24, you can also find in Mark 13 and in Luke chapter 21. And in, in Mark, it uses this verse along with uh, telling them they're going to be taken into the synagogue and flogged. And so that's why I would say this is directly to the disciples. Now, the, the next verse, I would say, is directly to us. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Guys, we're seeing, we're seeing the way that People treat each other. What comes to mind is Republicans and Democrats that are just not respectful at all. You know, the Republicans can, even our president can call the Democrats stupid. And then, you know, some of the things the Democrats do to the Republicans, it's, 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 not, it's not correct. Verse 11 says, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Now, this is not, in, this is not saying the same thing that verse Four said that many will come and and say I'm the Christ. This is false religion. This is this would be more like somebody taking the Bible and and saying you know this is what we believe for the Bible to say for these thousands of years, but this is what it actually means. This is this would be a false a false prophet or a false religion. And look at verse 12, goes right along with this. It says, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Now, this word lawlessness, it doesn't mean like, uh, you know, there's no police around, so there's looting and people, you know, going in and taking stuff out of stores. Not that, that's what I think of when I read lawlessness. But what this word is saying is that, that this lawlessness is a, a deviation from from the law. This, this, the disciples would un understood Jesus to say that there are, there are people that are not going to obey the Ten Commandments. They're not going to say, you know, these, these Ten Commandments are the way we live our life. They're going to, they're going to deviate from the Ten Commandments. They're going to deviate from, from what God says in his Bible 
you know, God's word, God, what God gives us to live our life by, this idea of lawlessness is there in, in this time that these false prophets are going to come and they're going to they're gonna try to tell us that the Bible means different than what it really says and, there are, and that people are going to buy into that. People are going to stop believing the Bible is the word of God and what's going to happen is their love for many is going to grow cold. So the Bible tells us straight up, love God and love people, but there's going to be there's going to be a group of people that deviate from the word. You can also read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This uh, Paul talks about the same thing. There was the church was saying, has the rapture already taken place? And Paul's like, no, 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 the rapture has not taken place. The it, it will not happen until there is a great falling away. That people that were were following God, they they believed in the Bible, but they they changed their view. They they switched from from the law. You can read also in the, the first chapter of Romans, starting at about, I think, verse 18, maybe it's 15, somewhere in there. It, it talks about the same progression. And in that, it says that they suppress the truth. They suppress the truth when, uh, with unrighteousness. And guys, this, this is where we're at. This is where the church is at. The church is split. The Christian church is split right now. And it's split because there's some people that are redefining marriage. There's some people in the church, call themselves Christians, that are saying abortion's okay, saying same-sex marriage is okay, saying it's okay to identify your gender. But I'm telling you, the Bible says God created male and female. And it, I'll move on. The next verse says, But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Endure, endures what? In, he who endures to the end. He who continues to believe that the Bible is God's word spoken to us. The, if, if, you can, if you endure, if you continue to believe God's word is God's word and live your life accordingly to it, you will be saved. You'll make it. Even when things get ugly and when tribulation happens and, and when... You know, even we're being martyred for our faith. You'll con if you endure in the word, if you continue to believe the word of God, you will be saved. You'll make it till the end. And the next verse says, verse 14, I'll stop with this one. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So if I were to answer the question, are we at the end times, I would say, man, so many of the boxes that are written for us in this first part of Matthew 24 have, have been checked. Um, and this idea, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. We're doing better than we ever have. I, Pastor Andrew and Dusty and Luke and I, each year in January, we go to Uganda and we preach a leaders conference at O Sunny Day Orphanage on Busi Island. And we get to visit with our family there and we love them so much. Every once in a while, some years, we will hop in the boat and we'll have a crusade on one of the islands. And when, always when we get to the islands, we're just amazed at, at how poor they are. I mean, this is just poor, 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 like dirt poor. And, um, you know, it's the grass roofs and, and you know, uh, no plumbing, of course. And, I, you know, it's just, it's not America. Okay, it's just, it's just dirty. And I bet you'll look around every once in a while, you'll see somebody holding a smartphone. Now, it's not, you know, it's not a nice, nice iPhone or, you know, Android, not a nice one. You know, more like a burner phone, but it's a smartphone. Now, there's about seven and a half billion people on this earth, and uh, we, we estimate, or the information I ran across is about a little over three billion of those people have not heard the good news. But there's five billion people in the world that have, have 
phones have smartphones, which give them the platform, you know, whether it's through YouTube or whatever, to hear the gospel. So guys, we are in a situation now where around the world, all, all people can hear the gospel. And listen to this verse 14 again. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, what are we supposed to do with that? Are we supposed to get all freaked out? I mean, Pastor Tom was reading that there's going to be more plagues. You know, I, hey, I didn't say that. Uh, Jesus told his disciple that, well, Pastor Tom said that there's going to be tribulation. We don't want tribulation. No, that's, that's, not, that's not what we're, what we're supposed to do with that. In, in this passage of Scripture, there's a, a few things that are written for us, what, exactly what we're supposed to do. There in verse 4, it says for us to take heed that no one deceives you. So we're supposed to take heed. What does that mean? It means to beware or discern. So if somebody comes up to you and says, well, the Bible says, or, you know, the blah, 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 you check it out. Don't just take their word for it. You go to the Word. You, you find another resource and, and ask them if that's true or, or find out for yourself. Take heed. And then also in verse 6, it says, See that you are not troubled. We're not supposed to freak out. We're not. This, the, Jesus is telling his disciples, telling us, when we see these signs happen, and these signs are signs to let us know where we are in history, when you see these signs happen, don't, don't be troubled. Don't get terrified. And then in verse 13, it says to endure. Endure. Persevere. Endure and persevere into what? Persevere in believing the Bible is God's Word. Persevere in reading it and studying it. If you think there's a contradiction into it, it should drive you into the Word. If you think that it, it doesn't say what it says, you, you, you get in there, you persevere, you endure, and you get into the Word. Endure in obeying what the Bible says. Endure, continue to obey. And then in verse 14, it says that we are to, this gospel is to be preached to every nation. So tell people, tell people about Jesus, the gospel, the good news. Tell them about the good news that, that Jesus died and paid the penalty for their sin. Remember a couple weeks ago, we were talking about this. If, if, the scripture that says, if you forgive people's sins, they'll be forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they won't be forgiven. I believe what that is saying is if you go to people and tell them that Jesus has already paid the penalty for their sins, then they'll understand their sins are forgiven. But if you don't go and if you don't tell them, they won't know. I want to pray for you. I encourage you to just cup your hands like this. I want you to just receive the the blessing of the Lord that he has for you right now as I pray. So Lord, I pray by your Holy Spirit that we will, we will take heed, that you will give us the power of your Holy Spirit to, to know what is truth and what is not truth, that we, you will give us the power to be able to discern if people are trying to deceive us or, or if a particular teaching is trying to, to teach us false doctrine. Lord, I also pray that your Holy Spirit would comfort us. Lord, your word tells us don't be troubled. Don't be terrified in this in any situation. Lord, I pray that the, the comforter and the counselor of the Holy Spirit will direct our mind to think in the way that we're supposed to think, direct our mind towards the word of God, so that we will have a peace instead of being troubled or terrified. Lord, give us a power to endure. Give us a power to endure in your word. Give us a power to endure and love you and love people. And Lord, I pray that you will give us a boldness. Lord, I pray that your, your spirit will be on us so that we will tell people the good news. We will, we will boldly tell people the good news. And, then, and when we tell them the good news, they'll be set free. Lord, I pray that your anointing will be on us, 
that we will be able to tell people the truths that they need to hear so that the oppression will leave them, the de depression will leave them, and they'll be able to be walk in a, to walk free in Jesus' name. Lord, we need your anointing. Holy Spirit, we need you. We need you to, to direct the way that we speak to people, the way we treat people. Lord, I, I pray that we'll receive words of knowledge and words of wisdom that we'll be able to prophesy over people as we go out through this day. Lord, I pray for everybody that's listening to this right now that you will, you will keep them healthy. I pray you send your, your protecting angels to watch over us, that none of us would, would be hindered or, or hurt by a, any type of virus or terrorist type act. And I pray all this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, once again, I want to say, Tammy and I love you, and we're praying for you, and we will see you again online.